say that Michael Zoss is a master teacher is an understatement. To say that his knowledge of his native state is unparalleled is simply a statement of fact. So you're in for a real treat uh, as the sage of Washington County, Michael Zoss, regales us with a few thoughts about Christmas in Iowa, memories and tradition. Michael Zoss. Don't you wonder if they gave introductions after the speech how different they would be? <laughs> I want to introduce my family that's here tonight. My wife, Julie, our daughter, Hannah, and our son-in-law, Colin. And they don't know it, but I've got jobs for them later. Um, when I was asked to do this, I rejoiced on the dates because I thought, three very special ladies in my family I was hoping could be here tonight, and that didn't work out, but one is. My, today is my mother's 85th birthday, and I was hoping she could be here, but she had a big day, and it didn't work out. Tomorrow is my wife's birthday. She will be a year older. <laughs> and Sunday is Edna, Edna Jones's birthday, who is one of my dearest friends, and she would have been 101. She passed away two, year, two weeks ago today, and she was going to be here. So, but anyway, she helped with the program. When asked to do Christmas in Iowa, uh, that's kind of like, how many people are there in Iowa? There's that many Christmases. There's so many wonderful ways, past and present, of celebrating this holiday. We'll give you just a few glimpses. Hopefully you'll be thinking of things in your own mind that have been special to you for this time of the year. Happy Winter Solstice. Is that the first you've had of that greeting this year? <laughs> or life, uh, we underestimate the winter solstice. And much of what we do this time of year is winter solstice-ish. It's seldom recognized. The winter solstice falls either on December 20th, 21st, or 22nd. This year it's the 21st in the Northern Hemisphere. The sun is directly over the Tropic of Capricorn. 23 and a half degrees south of the equator on the winter solstice. We have the shortest day of our year then. We say it's our first day of winter. The winter solstice is six hours and six minutes shorter daylight than the summer solstice in June. I thought that'd be easy to find. It wasn't. I had to do an awful lot of figuring. So if it isn't right, don't tell me. I like it like it is. Uh, but six hours difference between June and December. But the winter solstice is probably the first and the most widely commemorated natural event on Earth. People that we would consider very primitive acknowledged the winter solstice. If I had to figure out when it occurred, I don't think I could. But people thousands of years ago knew exactly the winter solstice when the days started getting longer. They called it the rebirth of the sun. The daylight part of the day begins getting longer. By about a minute and a half, I think. There are signs that Native Americans had winter solstice rites for thousands of years here. Some Indian mounds in northeast Iowa and southwestern Wisconsin are lined up so that the winter solstice sun and the summer solstice sun are lined up with those mounds. I can't think that that's an accident. Almost all peoples in the northern hemisphere have celebrated the winter solstice with Light being the overall theme. Bonfires, candles, the color white. The fires were to help the sun return. 
Hanukkah, the festival of lights, is a Jewish festival at the time of winter solstice. Most North America, most Northern Hemisphere cultures used candles, evergreens, feasting, and generosity to commemorate the return of the sun. 1600 years ago, the Christian church leaders decided that they needed to stamp out this horrible pagan celebration. So they arbitrarily placed the birth of Jesus at the same time and totally successfully stamped out the use of light, candles, evergreens, feasting, and generosity. <laughs> As we know, nothing was stamped out. It was absorbed into the Christmas celebration, or the Mass of Christ, Christmas. The rebirth of the sun became the birth of the sun. The celebration of Christmas did not survive crossing the ocean well. The Puritans felt that it was necessary to stamp out this celebration of Christmas because it wasn't mentioned in the Bible, so it shouldn't happen. And they were pretty successful, actually. Christmas was not celebrated much in early U.S. The Puritans said December 25th was not mentioned in the Bible, so should not be celebrated. Well... December isn't mentioned in the Bible either, but we have it. <laughs> Iowans' earliest settlers came from states back east, rather than directly from European countries. The early and middle 1800s was not a real religious time in our country. Christmas was not a big occasion for many of the early Iowans. The earliest Christmas was probably at, Fort, at the fort in Fort Madison in 1808 or 1809. Probably it consisted of greeting each other with wishes and an extra dose of whiskey, which was already part of your daily rations. <laughs> so that was probably the first celebration of Christmas in Iowa. Because of the wide diversity of Iowans, Christmas has been celebrated every way possible and can best be described as a blending or an absorption of many cultures. I will talk of a few special Iowa Christmas events or influences rather than try to cover everything. In pre-Civil War Iowa, midwinter on the frontier was not a great time to celebrate anything. <laughs> you were trying to survive. Some calling or visiting was probably done. Neighbors probably shared a meal of wild game, and maybe they saved a precious lump of butter to put on some cornbread on Christmas. If someone lived near a timber, walnuts and hickory nuts could be gathered and given to your friends on the prairie. If you lived in the prairie and there was a hazel brush thicket close to you, you could gather hazelnuts and give them to your friends from the timber. And that was probably about the extent of it. Christmas was often not even important in early Iowa churches. Probably still from those Puritans. Some early Iowa settlers did recognize the birth of Jesus around the winter solstice. Some Iowans did decorate for Christmas. Few Christmas trees were used in those early days in Iowa several reasons. One, Iowa had almost no evergreen trees. Cedar trees were not even widespread in Iowa. Two, most people on the frontier lived in very small houses. A 14 by 16 or a 16 by 18 log house or a cave dug into a river bank had very little space for anything. Imagine 20 people living in your bedroom. And that's probably bigger than what a lot of 20 people lived in. Imagine if, well, let's move aside, we're going to put up decorations. You know, it's, it's not going to happen. Evergreen symbolized immortality. A deciduous branch symbolized rebirth in life. So both had important meanings for this time of year. Since most people did not have access to evergreens, if they wanted to do... Uh, 
a tree. It was usually a deciduous branch. This is a piece of a walnut tree. And they wrapped it with rags or paper. And sometimes they didn't have either. So you would just have the branch. And then you would decorate it with things that you had. Here is a string of, like I said, Iowa cranberries. These are rose hips, the state flower. And I gathered these and strung them. And they're prettier than cranberries. And probably they dried them, and then you chewed on them all winter to get your vitamin C. Because vitamin C was not something there was lots of in Iowa. So we'll put some rose hips on there. Okay, there is 20 some kinds of milkweed in Iowa. These are native, I don't know if I can, we'll just set them here. One of the things I found was that sometimes people strung corn for their tree and they would string red corn. Well, if you remember the stories about husking bees when you were, they didn't have rubber bands on ears, I'm sorry, uh, but when you would open an ear and see a red ear of corn, that meant you had the pick of the girl there that night. So I'm sure people dug down through the corn quick if the desired young lady was there. So they kept the red ear, shelled it, and strung it and put it on the tree. Do you know how hard it is to punch a grain of corn with a needle? I tried, and I'll work on it some more tomorrow. But uh, I, I don't have the corn, but it's very pretty to put corn on a tree. And if you have house mice like we do, they would be very thankful for you to do that. Okay. There were very, very few, as I said, evergreens in Iowa. So one of the real treasures that you had, if you could find it, was a pine cone. Pine cones were traded items because that was as close as you could get to evergreen. People would gift pine cones. and you would hang nuts. Sometimes you would cover the nut with cloth, later on foil. And there's a hickory nut. And I never found where people did this, but if I lived then I would. I like galls on goldenrod. And you know, doesn't that look like some of the dangly things we put on trees? Uh -huh. yeah. And I like them when more than one wasp attack the golden rod. <laughs> and so I have them with two or three calls on. So, then this would be your Christmas tree. And doesn't that have meaning? There's symbols of everything that's there. The, the symbolism is, is very, very strong. And to me, that's a lot more meaningful than getting things on special the day after Christmas at Walmart for next year. <laughs> but we, we kind of do that rather than go collect goldenrod galls. Pine cones symbolized the tree of life, or a crown. And so that was why they were important on the tree. Beginning in the 1850s, people started coming to Iowa directly from other countries. Germans, English, Scandinavians, Bohemians, and other ethnic groups were coming to Iowa in large numbers. New ways of celebrating Christmas were appearing throughout the state. A little known group of people, of immigrants that came, really affected how Christmas was celebrated in Iowa and the country. These people came from the Central European country of Moravia and settled in several locations in Iowa. 
there were large Moravian communities back east. Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, uh, Salem, North Carolina, Hope, New Jersey are uh, Moravian communities. Eastern churches supported new Moravian settlements in Iowa. One lady who came to Grace Hill, Iowa, and Grace Hill, Iowa is in Washington County, had only given 50 cents when her church asked for money to support settlements in Iowa because she'd had no idea where Iowa was. <laughs> and then she ended up living here and probably wished she had given more than 50 cents. <laughs> The Moravian Church is considered the first Protestant denomination, having begun in the year 1467. You can be a Moravian by nationality, you can be a Moravian by religion. So you can be a German Moravian, you can be a Polish Moravian, you can be a Moravian Moravian, which maybe would be a Moravian squared, I'm not sure. Okay. The first Christmas celebrated by Moravians in North America was in 1741. Moravians were highly educated people and were extremely musical. That first Christmas Eve vigil in 1741 was lots of music, lots of singing, and they deliberately did it in the stable oh. rather than their home. The Moravians were some of the first people to write music in the New World. Moravian hymns were some of the very, very first and they were extremely advanced in their, um, in their works of harmony. Their first hymn, written in this uh, hemisphere, had 37 stanzas to it. They still use it. I thought we would sing that tonight. <laughs> then I wouldn't have to talk anymore. That would take up the time here. The most well-known of all Moravian hymns is a hymn called The Morning Star, written by Francis. F. Hagen, and this is a hymn some of you are probably familiar with. The Morning Star hymn was written by a man who was a minister in Iowa. He had a church in Power Street County, Iowa. And I want to just read the first line of the first four verses of that hymn. Morning Star, O cheering sight, ere thou camest how dark earth's night, morning star, thy glory bright, far excels the sun's clear light. Thy glad beams, thou morning star, clear the nations near and far. Morning star, my soul's true light, tarry not, dispel my night. Doesn't that sound like a winter solstice song? And it has a strong Iowa connection. The Moravians had seven congregations in Iowa. All except the Grace Hill congregation were disbanded by 1908. The first Moravians came to Washington County in 1854. They were mostly German speaking from Moravia and some were from Bohemia. They came through Ohio. The Moravians, when they settled at Grace Hill, one of the first things they did was plan their cemetery. Now, some of you may think that's not very optimistic. Uh, but the cemetery is very, very important to Moravians. The Moravian Cemetery in Grace Hill is one of the few cemeteries in Iowa that's a nationally recognized historic spot. They planned the cemetery with streets. The streets made a grid. Wherever the streets crossed, they planted four evergreen trees. Either white pine, Norway pine, spruce, or arborvitae. So there's a clumps of four trees in a grid in the cemetery. They also buried men on one side, women on the other side, and you were in rows according to your age. One of the few cemeteries in the country with that style of burial. Catherine Buxbaum from Grace Hill wrote a uh, she said it was a novel, it was very true, she just changed names in it, uh, about Grace Hill, called Iowa Outpost. It was published in 1948. The Moravian Christmas is described in detail in that book. It is a medley of sight, hearing, taste, touch, and smell. The eldest woman in the community was responsible for making the candles. 
This was considered an honor. I don't know whether it would be today, but when you got to be the eldest woman in the community, your job was to make the candles for Christmas. You started about six weeks before Christmas. So you would be making candles now, if you were the eldest. This was a big job. Also, about mid-November, the community cookie cutters were gotten out. There was one set of cookie cutters for the whole community. And they, were started, they started on their tour of the area. The cutters had come to Grace Hill with the family in October of 1865. They were made in Ohio by a tinsmith by the name of Henry Opolt. Now, how many cookie cutters... After 150 years, do we still know the name of the, bit, the maker? <laughs> I have those cutters. Here are the cutters from 1865. I don't have all of them. The really, really desirable one is with uh, a family member in Texas, and I hope to, to get a uh, tracing of it soon. Music was very important, a violin. Here's my favorite, a poplar tree. Now, how many of you have poplar tree cookie cutters? Um, fish, rhinoceros. <laughs> now these were considered for Christmas cookies. That's the only time they were used. A squirrel holding a nut. This is hard to make a cookie out of this. You have to have the dough just perfect or the nut falls off. The cookie cutter that's in Texas is a deer with a full set of antlers. And almost no one could make the dough to make a deer. Because the antlers fell off. And here's one of my favorites. It's a candle with the petticoat on it. Okay. Uh, all used the same recipe, but some people were just a whole lot better at making them than others. The dough had to be rolled out just perfect, had to be the right temperature. They were molasses cookies, and they were said you should roll the dough paper thin. And they're very good. I didn't know how many people were coming, so I couldn't bake enough. But trust me, they're very good. The recipe, which by the way, I have a copy for you if you want. It says on the recipe, these cookies will last indefinitely. <laughs> if kept well hidden. <laughs> Remember the first thing made in Grace Hill was the cemetery. That was so they could celebrate Christmas. Young people went to the cemetery a few days before Christmas and cut evergreen boughs. The only place there were evergreens in the whole county, in that whole part of the state. They decorated the church. They learned their pieces and their parts and songs. The church became a glowing, fragrant, joyous place of celebration. A putz, or nativity, was placed in the church. Some of these have been passed down in Moravian families for generations. I do not know of any in Iowa, but some of them have hundreds of figures. They sometimes take up a whole room in a family's home with all the figures, and they add to it every year. A special Moravian star was made and hung over the minister. I 
kind of believe in little miracles. And I had a bunch this week. It was just a joyous week. I, this is sort of like a Moravian star. Maybe you've seen them. A Moravian star, and they started this in the 1850s. A Moravian star has 26 points. Not 27, not 25. 18 of the points have square bottoms. Eight of the points have triangular bottoms, and that fits. So Moravian stars either have to have 26 points, 52 points, or 110 points. I stopped at Crowded Closet in Iowa City on my trips to the Hoover Library this week when I was hauling things home from the summer exhibit. And what did they have? They had a kit to make a Moravian star. Never seen one before. So here's what I mean. Square points, triangular points. And you put it together. I didn't want to put it together because I didn't know how I would get it here. But here, and it's paper. And they would hang one in their home and one in church. And I, I was just kind of joyous when I found that. And if you want to put it together, I've got all the parts right here. <laughs> After the program at church and the singing to candlelight, people got gifts. One of the first places where gifts were given in churches in Iowa. The gifts were candy, cookies, nuts, and oranges. And each young person got a candle. And that was very special. Remember that elderly lady would be making candles, dipping them, and then made a petticoat around them so if, when you burned them, the wax didn't get on your hands. And every kid got a candle, in addition to the one they used at church. The last Christmas celebration in Grace Hill was in 1969. I hope that we can revive that celebration, maybe next year. Many young Iowans learned about Christmas at first, or first really celebrated Christmas, in a one-room school, especially if their teacher was German or Moravian. Many young Iowans didn't go to church, so they learned about the Christmas story at school. Christmas Day was a regular school day. Even after 1900, it was not a day off. There were programs and decorations and singing. The window decorations. If you ever went to a one-room school, you had to make window decorations at Christmas. Wonderful. I learned the Bible story at my one-room school before I learned it at church. And I remember the verse, Mary, Joseph, and the babe lying in a manger. I thought, why that'd be crowded? <laughs> but I was just little, and I, that verse just always kind of bothered me. Eulalia Merchant Benson was one of my teachers in the one room school. She always had a big program. Santa came with presents for all, and everybody got bells and candy. And the boys got a pocket knife, and the girls got a doll. Can you imagine if teachers gave pocket knives today? <laughs> My friend Edna, born in 1908, said they never had a tree. After all, they were Welsh. <laughs> but they hung stockings on a chair as close to the chimney as possible. They got candy and fruit. And the boys got sleds and the girls got dolls and she'd a whole lot rather had a sled. <laughs> My friend Eula May said that they never had a tree, but they cut evergreen branches, stuck them in a bucket of sand, and tied them to the wall as best they could to make it look like a tree. <laughs> there were about 10 prisoner of war camps in Iowa during World War II, between 1944 and 1946. The main two were in Clarinda, southwest Iowa, where they housed German, Japanese, and Italian prisoners and in Algona, in north-central Iowa, with German prisoners. They held up to 3,200 German prisoners at Algona. Prisoners were used in farm work and truck farming. 
I once accepted the Germans very well. After all, over half of the people in Iowa are part German. The Japanese and Italians, unfortunately, did not fare as well. The Algona prisoners had their own orchestra, chorus, and dramatic group. They were paid 80 cents a day. They were so pleased here in Iowa that to show their gratitude, a man by the name of Eduard Kalb, who had been an engineer in Germany, decided that he, sh with the help of other prisoners, he wanted to help so that they wouldn't be homesick, and he wanted to show the people in Iowa that they had the same faith. So starting in 1945, excuse me, 44, and for over a year, they carved a nativity set. And maybe some of you have seen this in Algona. They made the forms out of wire, covered them with cement, covered them with plaster, and then carved a half-size nativity set with over 60 figures. When it was premiered to people in Iowa in 1945, it said people just cried and cried at seeing it. One person said, I learned the true meaning of peace on earth on an Iowa hillside from prisoners of war. The Algonan nativity is Iowa's most famous. I brought several here. I sort of like nativity sets. I thought my wife would be flopping around on the floor on that one. Uh, we have a little over 1,800. <laughs> Here's my very first from when I was five years old. Here's one that you can see closer later. It's a puzzle made out of an oak beam of a barn. And this one is a, made by an elderly man in Earlville, Iowa. Uh, his name is um, Julius Engelken. And he does marvelous work with Iowa wood. And we will be displaying all of our nativities at the Ainsworth Opera House the first two weeks of December. Another small miracle. I wanted this puzzle and I wanted this nativity for tonight. 1,800 nativities don't fit in one box. <laughs> they don't fit in one room. I thought, gee, I want those two nativities. They were both in the same box, the first one I looked at. <laughs> so I think they were supposed to be. Otherwise, I could still be looking. Feasting in, with family and friends has been a part of this season for generations. In Iowa, most farm homes are set up so that you eat in the room the food's prepared in. Isn't that nice? We should always eat in the room where the food is prepared. I'll end with several favorite family stories. Not all family, but some of them are. And I hope it reminds you of favorite stories that you have. One of my very first Christmas trees, when I got my own house, had fallen off a truck on the highway and been ran over. <laughs> and I took it home, and it was one of my very favorite trees. My grandparents were married in 1917. That same year, they ordered from Montgomery Wards a Christmas tree. Where I'll put it. We would call it a Charlie Brown tree, probably now. And the branches do come down. And I have here the original decorations also. It is made of goose feathers, laid on a, a wire, and then a tiny wire goes around and splits the feathers to make the needles. And that's still, still in the original box from 1917. It's the only Christmas tree they ever had. My great-grandparents lived on the farm for the first 72 years of their married life. <laughs> under their tree, <laughs> under their tree, they always had a paper mache Santa Claus, and there he is. 
This Santa is from a German family, and maybe you know it's a roly-poly Santa, and it's more valuable than I am. It's not mine. Uh, but that's a, a German. German and Moravians were the two real great Christmas celebrators. My great-grandparents, as I said, lived on the farm for 72 years. And if you would go visit there, my grandpa would always give you pennies. And my great-grandma, if you were a girl, you could go through her stack of feed sacks and pick out a feed sack. And that would be your present. And maybe if you were bigger, you hoped that she had another one of that same pattern the next time you went there. When our son Adam was three, Santa brought him a wooden coaster wagon. It came dissembled in a flat box. Santa thought it would be easier to transport and hide if it was left in the box. So it appeared under the tree in the box. When Adam opened the box, in among the dissembled parts was a dead mouse. <laughs> Santa should have opened the box, but he didn't. Whenever anyone asked Adam what he had received for Christmas that year, he never said a wagon. He always said, I got a dead mouse. <laughs> the local paper put an article in about it. And what kind of parents would let Santa give this nice little boy a dead mouse? He did go many miles in that wagon. He's now 26 and a tax specialist for the U.S. Treasury Department. Maybe that was caused by the dead mouse. I don't know. One of my favorite Christmas stories is this. An elderly lady said that when she was a small child, she was from a large family, her father had died, the mother's brother moved in with them. He was unmarried. And he lived and helped him work the farm. He wore red, long underwear in the winter time and she said we always knew when Christmas was coming because the old long underwear her mother had cut in strips and when Christmas was coming she replaced all the wicks in the lamps with red wicks <laughs> and that was their sign that Christmas was coming now, isn't that a nice, tiny little thing that was very important in that family? My grandmother, with whom I lived for a number of years, was from a very large, hard-working Bohemian farm family. She said they put up a tree on Christmas Eve and put real candles on it. And somebody had to stand with a stick with a wet sponge on it to wash the candles. She said that they always knew what they were going to get for Christmas. They got the same thing every year. And we look forward to it, she said. Every year we got a pencil and an orange. The only orange that we had all year. She said, I carried the orange around for days just thinking about what that's going to taste like. She said, sometimes I almost carried it too long. <laughs> but the anticipation was a big part of it. It was a very special treat. We always had an orange in our stocking. I put oranges in our kids' stockings. And many of you probably have orange Christmas stories. You all have Christmas stories. Cherish them. Write them down. I want to close with a poem from one of my favorite Iowa poets, a dear friend, Onita Griggs Fisher. We walked the mile to Hartzler's woods and chose our tree, a room-tall pine. It held a dove's nest, vacant now, and gave support to leafless vines. We sat on needled carpeting 
and thought of shade-cooled summer air, of rain in ribbons through spring nights, of mists like spun glass angels' hair. We talked of stars and frost-sparkled days, of cashmere snow on graceful limbs, of wild things, rabbits, mice, and deer, with jays and cardinals for trim. So when you see our Christmas house, if it is strangely bare, go north to Hartzler's woods and look at our green tree. We left it there. <laughs> and if you go to Hartzler's woods, after 30 years, the tree is still there. Thank you. Happy winter solstice and Christmas.